All right, everyone, uh, welcome to tonight's program. My name is Dr. Kelly Fonto Dietz, I'm the Director of Collections and Visitor Engage Engagement at Stratford Hall. I am also an archaeologist, and that's how I know our speaker tonight, Jack Gary, who I've been friends with now for many years, let's say, <laughs> going back a while. So, been Jack while. Gary. Yeah, just a little bit of time. Um, Jack Gary is the Director of Archaeology at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. He came there from years he spent at Poplar Forest, Thomas Jefferson's Poplar Forest, where he was the Director of Archaeology there as well. He has a master's degree in historical archaeology from UMass Boston, and he went to my alma mater, William and Mary, whoop, whoop, uh, for his undergrad um, in anthropology. And so he is a friend of mine. He's a colleague of mine. He's a fascinating individual with really good stories. And I actually just recently was reminded of his, his wonders when I saw you at the Mars Chocolate Conference give a short version of this talk. And we were all on the edge of our seats. And I was like, wow, he has me excited about gardens. So at Stratford Hall here, we have um, a restored... 18th century garden and it's beautiful but I have to say after hearing your five minutes I'm looking at the garden differently so I'm excited to have you on tonight Jack so thank you thank you for having me I am thrilled to be here thrilled to be talking with uh, with everybody and uh, for those of you who are wondering the a, a Mars chocolate society meeting is that oh is that any fun the answer is yes <laughs> amazing <laughs> i've never seen so much chocolate in my life it was awesome great to, great to connect with you again and uh and to bring about the tonight's tonight's lecture so yeah awesome i'm gonna go ahead and just give the microphone to you i'm gonna go ahead and turn my screen off if you're just zooming in we have disabled the chat function so if you have a question for mr gary go ahead and put it right in the bottom in the q a i will be moderating questions and answers at the end of the lecture so without further ado jack gary the stage is yours Great, thank you, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I, I was telling uh, Dr. Dietz on as we were kind of getting set up. I was debating whether to do this from my office, which is a pretty boring space. And I thought, well, no, I'll do it from the lab, from one of our archaeology labs here at Colonial Williamsburg. And I realized, boy, this is kind of a boring space too. You get the, you get the view of a, a shelf, but I brought some artifacts out, including, including. I think you'll enjoy this. All right, this is just to kind of get everybody set up. One of John Custis wine bottles uh, from our excavation. We're going to see more of that here in just a minute. Uh, so that's just to just to whet your appetite. So let's let's dig in. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen. Let's see here. Okay. Okay. Hope everybody can can see that. And um, the the impetus for um, this project and and this talk was um, we were approached in twenty well I believe twenty seventeen uh, by quite frankly a very generous benefactor who had an interest in gardens and there was one major garden here in Colonial Williamsburg that really had not been explored. Um, actually, we could say that there are other gardens that haven't been explored too, but there's one that really stood out to us, and that was the garden of John Custis IV. Um, so many of you may know, actually I'm sure this group know a little bit about John Custis, and uh, let's go ahead and take a look at him here. And John Custis IV was known for a variety of different distinctions. Uh, most folks know him as the first father-in-law to Martha Washington. Uh, but he was also a politician. He was a major mover and shaker here in Williamsburg. He was incredibly wealthy. Uh, he enslaved over 200 people uh, on his various plantations. And he was a gardener extraordinaire. Uh, so some people may know him for that as well. And I, I want to start off by kind of giving you a flavor for the guy. He's, he's a bit of a character. And um, I think that comes through best in his own words. So let's take a, <laughs> let me give you just a, a little, a little flavor of him through some of his own quotes, some of my favorites anyway. He was the brother-in-law to William Byrd II. They were friends. They swapped uh, gardening uh, ideas. They would go back and forth to each other's houses. They would hang out. Um, their wives were sisters. Um, but after William Byrd, the first, first wife, passed away, uh, he was in London, and he was looking for his second wife at the time. 
And uh, John Custis wrote to him, he wrote a letter and he said, here has several ships arrived from London, but not one word from Colonel Byrd by any of them, which makes me think you were dead. Or what is worse, married. So as, you, as we will see later, John Custis is not one of the world's great lovers, that's for sure. Now, as for his garden, um, remember, this is one of the richest men in Virginia in the early 18th century. He could really kind of do whatever he wanted with this garden space. And um, he wrote to a friend of her, his, he said, I am told that striped and variegated plants, he's talking about boxwoods in this case, he said, I, I, I'm told they're out of fashion, but I do not mind that. I always make my fancy my fashion. So he was willing to, you know, buck uh, convention and uh, you know, he had enough money. He didn't care. He was going to do whatever he wanted to do in his in his garden. And then um, one final one, which uh, I shared at the, uh, the chocolate uh, the chocolate meeting, Custis was constantly in bad health. He was always complaining of some, uh, some malady. And uh, he, he'd been ill for almost a year. And uh, he finally recovered from whatever this illness was. And he attributed his recovery to drinking chocolate every day for a year. So he wanted to get more chocolate from his merchant. Um, and he said he wanted chocolate that was good and cheap. Well, those two things don't normally mix, as most people know. Uh, but he had a solution to this. And he says, it's reasonable to think that some prizes may be taken from the Spaniard hauling cocoa, which will make it cheap. So John Custis was advocating for black market chocolate stolen from Spain, <laughs> the Spanish ships that were trying to ship it back to, to Spain. So it, it just gives you a little sense of, of John Custis and the kind of character that he was. Um, he was born into a wealthy uh, uh, family of tobacco planters on the eastern shore of Virginia. Uh, and as a young teenager, he was sent over to England to... Um, for his education. And it wasn't a traditional education. It was uh, actually, he was apprenticed with tobacco merchants where he was taught the art of making money, quite frankly. And when he came back to the Eastern shore in his early twenties, after spending seven years in England, uh, he inherited multiple plantations, one from his father and one from his grandfather, along with numerous enslaved individuals. Uh, and those two plantations were Hunger's Plantation and Arlington Plantation. Um, and Custis spent a good deal of his uh, bachelor days on, at Arlington Plantation, and he loved the Eastern Shore. I think if, uh, if he had not gotten married, and if he hadn't had political ambitions, I think he would have spent the rest of his life on the Eastern Shore. Um, his wealth was increased, though, through a very advantageous marriage that brought into his circuit uh, Queens Creek Plantation, which we see on the map here, just north of Williamsburg. Uh, and then he purchased another plantation closer to Richmond in New Kent County called White House Plantation. So he owns a significant amount of land uh, across Virginia. And he's raising tobacco on all these pieces of property as most planters were in the early 18th century. Uh, again, the marriage was an advantageous one, but it was also an acrimonious one. Uh, he married Francis, who we see there on the right. Uh, and Francis was the daughter of Daniel Park II, who was one of Virginia's great scoundrels. This guy was an absolute piece of work. Um, Daniel Park II owned Queens Creek Plantation just north of Williamsburg, but he abandoned his family and his young daughter, Francis, and went to England to go make his fortune in the military. Um, and he did. He became pretty well off, uh, but he's, he had multiple affairs that resulted in uh, children, uh, one of which he sent back to his wife in Virginia to raise as his nephew. Uh, so he, he was not particularly well liked and he was eventually made the governor of Antigua, uh, the royal governor of Antigua in the Leeward Isles, uh, where uh, an angry mob eventually got fed up with him and, and, and killed him. And that, uh, that left behind quite a, uh, an inheritance for Francis and then, and then John, who had just married Francis. Now, Francis and John Custis did not like each other at all. Um, it, was not a, it was not a love match, that's for sure. And uh, the two quarreled in public so often that they had to have a lawyer draw up articles of agreement to settle their differences. And uh, in, this, uh, in the articles of agreement, it stated that John Custis, one of the wealthiest men in Virginia, 
had to give Francis and the children enough money to actually clothe themselves properly. Uh, and in return, Francis had to stop calling John Custis bad names in public. So that was the agreement the two <laughs> had to come to. Sadly, Francis did not uh, live um, very long. She, she uh, died in 1714 uh, of smallpox. John Custis did not remarry uh, after that. But soon after her death, um, he decided to move into the newly forming town of Williamsburg. And, and he, he actually never returned to the Eastern Shore of Virginia, despite that being the, his, uh, as we would call it today, his happy place. Uh, he never returned to the Eastern Shore of Virginia. Uh, rather, he purchased a four acre piece of property uh, just on the south side of the newly forming town of Williamsburg. I've got that highlighted in red here in that, that box. And one of the questions that we've asked about uh, with this project that we're engaging in right now is why did he choose that piece of property? He could, he could have bought anywhere in town. And um, the answer comes with looking at um, how Williamsburg was starting to form at the time. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Williamsburg, the large street running down the middle is Duke of Gloucester Street. That's the, the main street in town. And what I want to show you is um, where the major centers of power had already been established by the 17 teens when Custis buys this piece of property. Not, not a whole lot was going on in town yet, but again, some major centers of power had already been established. I think it's really telling where they are compared to where Custis buys this four acre piece of land. So let's take a look here. So on the right hand side of your screen is the Capitol building. On the left hand side at the other end of Duke of Gloucester Street is the College of William and Mary. In the center of town is Bruton Parish. And then to the north is the Governor's Palace. But in the 17 teens, there wasn't really a center of power on the south side of town yet. And so Custis buys this piece of property, kind of putting himself you know, on axis with the governor and with the, with the Church of England, quite frankly, in the center of town, really, I think, really showing off where he saw himself in the hierarchy of this newly forming town of Williamsburg. And that's really some of the first um, kind of glimpses we see of Custis as a landscape designer. He's manipulating the landscape or he's using the landscape to, um, to create a scene, quite frankly. And, and this gets even more interesting um, here in just a minute. Uh, by 1717, he had built a house on the property and, and he was living in it. And that house, which was demolished sometime in the early 19th century, um, there's very little information about what it looked like. The building I'm showing you here is called Remo Recess, which is in Fluvanna County, and it was built in the 19th century. Um, probably soon after John Custis's house was demolished, but I'm showing it to you because uh, it is stated that the inspiration, one of the inspirations for Remo Recess, there were two, one was Bacon's Castle, and the other was John Custis's house at Custis Square, which was referred to as the Six Chimneys House. Now, if you know Bacon's Castle, you know that this doesn't look a whole lot like Bacon's Castle, so it's maybe the tower uh, part of it. So I think it's more inspired by Custis's house at Custis Square. So this may give us some sense of what that house looked like, uh, even though it's long gone and there's almost no record of what it looked like, other than it being called the Six Chimneys House, which is a pretty cool name. Um, it was also remarked in 1824 by Lafayette, who was making uh, his Grand American tour, uh, visiting all these important places in America. He went by Custis Square and he said that Colonel Custis's house was dilapidated. So by 1824, the place had fallen into disrepair, we think was gone from the landscape uh, soon thereafter. But let's take a look um, at another map here, if you'll, if you'll indulge me. Um, what we're looking at is some LIDAR data. LIDAR is laser scanning from an airplane that gives you really fine grained topographic uh, data to, to show the, the, the way the land form is. And in this case, the dark that we see uh, running through there, kind of these fingers are ravines, systems of ravines that are there today and were there in the 18th century as well. And uh, so I've got outlined Custis Square, the four acre piece of property that John Custis bought uh, in the 17 teens, had his house there by 1717. But we've also highlighted other pieces of property that he either inherited from his scoundrel father-in-law, Daniel Park II, on one side of the ravine, and then he bought all of the property on the other side of this ravine. So lots 353, 54, and 55, he purchased those. 
And then he bought this other little lot called Lot M. So what he has now done is he controls all of this, this uh, space around the system of ravines. Those ravines could not be built on. Uh, they could not be sold as actual lots. But if you bought all the land around them, you doubled your land holding without actually having to buy anything. So what he then does is he builds two uh, little rental buildings. So on, look on lot 354 and 355, those little mustard colored rectangles, he tucks them into the corners of those two lots. And what he's doing here, we're almost certain, is he's using them to now create a frame for his view from Custis Square. We see the house down there, yeah, another mustard colored square, looking directly to Bruton Parish. So he's created a frame out over the system of ravines, uh, which are acting almost like natural ha-has that, um, that are kind of cutting him off from town, but they don't cut off his view into town. And he's creating this very kind of careful um, constructed view to Bruton Parish. Now, one of the things that we did as part of this project is, oh, here we go. Here's a nice, uh, here's a nice image of, this is Rest House in, in Bedfordshire about, uh, about the time, this is in England, uh, about the time that Custis is, is designing his property. Now, this is, not, of course, not on the scale of what Custis is doing in Williamsburg, but it's a good example of the, the use of an eye catcher in the distance, which is a pretty normal convention uh, in, in English gardens to take at something in the distance and, and create avenues down to it or vistas out to it. I think Stratford Hall is a pretty nice example of that looking out to the river, don't they? Uh, and so we see that here. At, I think that's what Custis is doing as well. But we, we kind of flipped the question here from what does Custis see to what could you see if you were at Bruton Parish of Custis's property? And so what you're seeing here is that same LIDAR data, but we're, we've done what's called a viewshed analysis. And everything that is highlighted in green, well, actually, let me back up. First off, the little blue dot up by Bruton Parish, that would be you if you were standing there in the 1720s, let's say on the south side of Bruton Parish, which is the main entrance into the church. We then asked the a computer program that we use here called ArcGIS, we asked it to show us everything that you could have seen, highlight everything you could see if you were standing at the south entrance to Bruton Parish. And that shows up as green. If you can't see it, it's gray. And you can see the LIDAR underneath. So look what those two little rental buildings do to your view from Bruton Parish out to Custis Square. They create this kind of cone of vision or view directly to Custis Square. So it is really about not just the view to Bruton Parish, but the view back to John Custis and him showing once again where he sees himself in the hierarchy of town. Um, and we, there we go, there's an arrow just to, just to ram home the point there, <laughs> the view is directly to John Custis. And we, we did a very rudimentary model. Admittedly, this, this is very rudimentary, but it is to scale. So this is if you were standing at the south entrance to Bruton Parish, looking to the south, you see his two rental buildings framing, there his house is in the distance and the ravines cut it off. It's like an island floating out there. Um, and again, I think this is a great example of Custis um, using his, his knowledge of the landscape to, with, as part of his landscape design. It's a you know, convention often referred to as the, you know, tapping into the genius of the place. And I think that's what he's doing here um, with this layout. So this is a pretty neat discovery. Uh, the other piece to this is that Custis had a pew in, um, in Bruton Parish. And where was it? It was right next to the south door. So you had to walk by John Custis open the doors, and then what do you see in the distance? Nothing but his property. So I, I just, this is just a, a, a great, I think, representation of how he saw himself. Now, what about him in, in gardening? Let's talk a little bit about what we know about um, Custis as a gardener. A lot of our information comes from uh, his correspondence that he struck up between a variety of different horticultural luminaries at the time, including John Bartram in Philadelphia, uh, Mark Catesby, who actually lived in Williamsburg for a time, and then most importantly, a man named Peter Collinson, who was a botanist in England, who um, the two of them struck up a, a, a decades-long friendship. They never met each other in person. 
but through correspondence, they started to swap gardening ideas and plants, primarily plants, back and forth. And Collinson referred to the two of them as brothers of the spade, uh, which is just a great uh, thing. What's well, a title to a book? Uh, matter of fact, the transcription of the records between the two of them is, is called Brothers of the Spade. Um, and, and so these two had a, a lifelong friendship. And through their letters, we get to see a lot of the plants that Custis is planting in his gardens here at, in Williamsburg. One of the frustrating things for us, although it's an opportunity for us as archaeologists, is that Custis never really describes what the garden looks like or how it's laid out. There's re references to wide gravel paths in the garden. Uh, there are clipped topiaries in the garden, uh, boxwood hedges. But how it's actually all laid out, we, we don't know. Um, he, he never leaves behind a record of that. But if we look at the plants that he is swapping back and forth with Collinson, it's, um, I mean, it is just a veritable who's who of, of plants in the early 18th century, including tons of tulips to the point that Custis has his portrait painted with a Dutch double tulip. And he's holding a book with on the spine written of the tulip. Uh, so that was one of his favorite plants and he planted literally hundreds if not thousands of them, um, probably hundreds of varieties and thousands of actual bulbs in this, in this garden. But he was also planting um, uh, exotic plants uh, like pistachio trees and almond trees in this garden. Many of these varieties, which Collinson is sending over, some of, you know, many of them are thriving in the English gardens. He sends them over to, to Custis and they just don't do well at all. Because this is, some of these plants, this is the first time they've ever been planted in America. So no one really knows what's gonna happen to them. And Custis finds out that a lot of these plants just are not suited <clears throat> to growing in Virginia. Uh, and by the 1730s, he actually writes that he, he gets so frustrated with the failures that he's having in his garden that he, he finally writes that <clears throat> the plants that I need need to be Virginia proof. That's what he says, Virginia proof plants. So he's actually recognizing what gardeners today already know and, and, and recognize. It's native vegetation that does the best in one's garden. Um, Another thing that we see with Custis and his love of plants is that he, he recognizes um, swampland in particular as a place of great biodiversity, which most people in the early 20th, uh, excuse me, early, 19th, <laughs> early 18th century um, thought of swamps as something to be drained and farmed. They were unhealthy, get rid of them. <clears throat> Custis actively bought swampland in order to save it, actually to protect it. And he would complain when people would destroy their swamps because he knew that there were plants in there that you couldn't find anywhere else on the planet. And he would get, uh, he would uh, gather plants from the swamps and he would send them over to Peter Collinson to be propagated over in England. So there's a real back and forth between these two. Literally hundreds of different varieties of plants are being swapped back and forth. Again, not much uh, knowledge in how the garden was laid out, but there could be a connection with uh, the garden at the College of William and Mary. Uh, we're seeing here what's a, a, an engraving from what's called the Bodleian Plate, which was an engraved plate uh, showing the Wren Building, the Brafferton, and the President's House at the College of William and Mary in the early 18th century, and, and showing the garden on that side of the, of the college. <clears throat> and we see clipped topiaries in the shapes of pyramids and balls. And, and that's, what, that's what Custis refers to in, in, uh, for his topiary. Now the connection here, and, and we haven't fully made it yet, and we may not ever be able to make it 100%, but a man named Thomas Kreese, who is a gardener that did work for the governor at the governor's palace, Governor Spotswood. He did work at the garden at William and Mary, and he did work on the garden at uh, Westover for William Byrd II, and he carried letters between John Custis and William Byrd II. So it's really possible that, that Thomas Kreese had a hand in the layout and the look of Custis of Custis's garden. So I, I certainly think that Custis is guiding uh, what goes into this garden, but Thomas Kreese may be the one who's starting to lay some of these things out and, and actually formalizing this garden. So um, so we look at the at the Wren building and the Wren garden there, and we think, okay, maybe this this is kind of what Custis is trying to do uh, at Custis Square with some of these plants. Now, <clears throat> let me pause for a quick sip of water because this this is pretty fun. Perhaps most fantastically, if you will, 
there is record of there being three leaden statues in Custis's garden. Lead statues uh, were becoming very common in the early 18th century in English gardens. Um, they were an economical way, you could cast them. Um, uh, they were an economical way of getting statues into gardens without having to have a sculptor sculpt them out of stone. And that's what they were doing. They were mimicking stone uh, uh, sculpture. But in America in the early 18th century, very few people, if, if anybody other than Custis had lead figure, figure statues. And so the figures that were stated to be in this garden were Apollo, Bacchus and Venus, the three deities. And um, you know, where they stood, I, we're not sure. Um, uh, sadly, the fate of these statues is a tragic one. Uh, in later years, uh, the property was rented out to a man named Joseph Kidd in the late 1700s. Joseph Kidd was a plumber. And remember, these are lead. And what do plumbers need for their trade? Lead. And it was stated that Joseph Kidd actually Actually turn them into downspouts for houses around. He melted down Apollo and Venus, as a matter of fact, um, and used them for gutters around town. But it was stated that Bacchus was spared the cleaver and that he remained. Uh, so he's not there today, but we have it as our, you know, kind of our brass ring or a lead ring, if you will, uh, as to find Bacchus in our excavation. So, but anyway, lead statues in an American garden in the early 18th century is really over the top. So I mean, this is a, a really special place that Custis is creating. And the garden didn't stop on the outside with Custis. Um, he was a lover of paintings and prints, and he was one of the first subscribers. He's one of the first people in America to own a full set of Ferber's 12 Months of Flowers. These are iconic uh, images. As a matter of fact, you, you, you can find them all over Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, I think everybody has them in their house in Williamsburg. You go to the Goodwill, you can find Ferber's all over the place. Re reproductions, not the originals. But anyhow, they're all over the place. But the very first ones were being hung in, uh, in houses like John Custis. And so he had a full set of Ferber's. Um, and these are prints that were showcasing um, each month of the year with a variety of plants arranged in these big uh, decorative urns. And the idea was that you could then pick out plants that you wanted. There was a key to which plants were in there, and then you could order the seeds for them and plant them in your garden. And so Custis had these in his house. Matter of fact, in um, the, his estate inventory after his death, they were listed as hanging in the, I believe, on the stair uh, in the house. So they're in a prominent place. He also uh, went to the trouble of ordering fireboards. Uh, and he asked his merchant to get fireboards painted with flowers in urns. This obviously is not one of them. This is from the 19th century, but this gives you a sense of a fireboard. So these would be put in the fireplaces in summertime. And so he wanted, he wanted urns full of flowers on his fireboards and his fireplaces. Uh, and when he received them uh, from his merchant, he was so disappointed in the painting. He thought it was just the hideous thing he had ever seen that he refused to put them in his fireplaces. And he ended up just putting actual urns full of flowers in his fireplaces in the summertime when they, when they weren't in use. So the garden wasn't just the outside. He was bringing it indoors as well. And, and it's another, I think, kind of, uh, it's not revolutionary by any means, but not many Americans were starting to use houseplants at the time. In England, uh, there were folks who were starting to, to, to bring plants and flowers indoors, cut plants. But in America, it was not, it hadn't, just, it hadn't really caught on yet. But here we see Custis doing just that, putting cut flowers in his, uh, in his fireplaces in the summertime. So again, there's not much, you know, there's no good, just there's no map of this property. There's no line by line description of oh, and this garden contained this and this garden was this big. But when we pull this together uh, and the scope and the scale that we know this property is this four acre property, I come back to often this image here of a property in the Cotswolds in England, it's called Sevenhampton. I'm not saying this is what the Custis Garden looked like, but I think this is a good uh, idea of the scale of the garden where you have a, 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 your central structure, support structures, and then attached gardens with parterres and maybe even orchards in them. And then look to the north or to the, I guess, to the top of the house there and that carefully constructed view out to the distance. But we see that again, right? Um, so that's, a, again, a common convention. We see Custis doing that too. So I, I think this is somewhat similar to what we might 
expect to find as we get into the garden um, uh, excavations, which I'll get to here in just a minute. So just to kind of finish out the life of Custis, um, he died in 1749, and he was buried on the eastern shore of Virginia. Uh, and so I guess I, I said he didn't go back, but I guess he did eventually, didn't he? <laughs> and so um, he had on his tombstone, I got to move my little box here to, to read it, but you can read it there, I think. Um, it's one of the things that he's noted for. He said that uh, uh, he said aged 71 years and yet lived but seven, which was the space of time he kept a bachelor's house at Arlington on the eastern shore of Virginia. Essentially, he's saying the only time he was ever happy is when he was a bachelor before he before he got married to Francis. So, you know, even in death, he was he was uh, poking that poor woman. So uh, Custis dies in 1749. The property is inherited by his son, Daniel Park Custis, um, who had just married Martha Dandridge, uh, who had become Martha Dandridge Custis. And the two of them, we don't believe ever lived at this property. As a matter of fact, they uh, we believe they, they shut the house up and just let it sit there. Uh, they lived in New Kent County at, at White House Plantation. That was their main seat. And uh, so until uh, Daniel Park Custis's death in 1757, I don't think much was happening at all at Custis Square. Martha, after uh, Daniel's death, turns around pretty quickly and marries George Washington. So Martha and George now own Custis Square. The two of them have no interest in this property at all. And um, the next time we, we see it pop up is in the 1780s, uh, right before it is, um, it is given to, uh, um, actually to uh, uh, Jackie uh, Custis. Uh, and it shows up on the Frenchman's map, which is a map of town uh, created in 1781 to show where French troops were being uh, bivouacked uh, after the Battle of Yorktown. And it shows up as the four acre square and there are little dots all around it, which we believe are trees that surround this lot. And then we see the house, uh, the kitchen next to it. And then there's two outbuildings that are also shown on this, on this map, but no hint of the garden on there. And as a matter of fact, we believe by the time uh, uh, it's, it's eventually given to Jackie Custis, it had been rented for many years. Uh, George Washington rented it to a variety of different people, including William Byrd III, um, and a couple other folks around town, but eventually it seems to start to decline. And we see that when one of the renters asks if he can make it a pasture for his horses. And so by that time, I think the garden is probably gone. George Washington says, yeah, sure, make it a pasture. He doesn't care. And by that, by, so by the 1780s, I think the garden is completely gone on this property. Um, one of the things that Martha and George do after inheriting the property is to, uh, this is in the 1750s, is to auction off as much as they can uh, out of the house before starting to rent it out. So keep that in mind, they auction off things and then, and then start to rent it. It comes up again here in just a minute. The property goes to a variety of different owners. And then, as I said, by the, the mid 1800s, um, really the early 1800s, it had fallen in, into disrepair and we believe was gone from the landscape by the 1830s. It is bought, the four acres is bought by the expanding Eastern State Hospital, also known as the Public Hospital. And Eastern State Hospital is one of the, uh, it is the oldest institution in America dedicated to the treatment of mental health. And it had begun to expand significantly in the 19th century before burning and then expanding again. And so the, the photograph you see here from the 1920s is, is showing the, the Eastern State Hospital campus. It's, it's sprawling. And then Custis Square is just to the side of it there. And they, they owned the property and they used it as a park for their patients, a park and a garden for their patients. But they never developed most of it. You're going to see here in a minute that they kind of sneak a building onto the edge of the property. But for the most part, it remains just an open uh, pasture. And that's how we encountered it uh, when we started our excavation. As a matter of fact, Colonial Williamsburg bought the property in the 1760s, and they used it primarily as pasturage for the, uh, the oxen that, uh, that pull the carts around town. So it had not been developed, which was great for us as archaeologists. And I think you also note that it, it had not been returned to a garden, and there had not been an effort by Colonial Williamsburg to recreate the garden early on. Whereas we'd been recreating the Governor's Palace Gardens and a lot of other gardens around town, Custis Square was untouched. So we can go into it completely fresh. Uh, we don't have to overturn uh, earlier uh, colonial revival work uh, or any preconceptions that come with that. 
So it's it's great to have this almost blank slate to, to work off of. So that's what it looked like at the beginning of our project. And before I get into the, the uh, results of our current excavations, the first work done by Colonial Williamsburg was in 1964. Uh, and the goal at the time was to find the house. Really, it was, it was find the house and understand the life of John Custis. And, and actually there was a, a real desire to try and see if, can we find anything related to George Washington because he owned the property? Uh, and, and, and they, they did find the house and what they found, I, I have to outline it in blue here because it's so hard to see. They found the robbed out cellar hole for the, the building. Every bit of brick for this building was robbed out after it was demolished in the early 1800s and taken away, leaving behind just, just the hole for the cellar, which had gotten filled in. Um, but you'll see in the, at the kind of the edge of the image there, a vaulted tunnel that drained the cellar. And here's a picture of that, of that tunnel. Uh, and there's director of archeology, span Ivernal Hume climbing inside the tunnel. And uh, for the life of me, I still don't know what it is that he's looking at in this image. It looks like a piece of paper. I don't know if, he's, <laughs> if it's a map to try and find his way out because uh, as the story goes, he stated that he got stuck in the tunnel and, um, and he was, uh, it was one of the most frightening things in his life. Zach, I have to interrupt. That is the coolest picture of Noel I've ever seen. Go ahead. No. <laughs> it's really, really incredible. Huh. I thought something was wrong. Good. I'm glad that you like it. <clears throat> really interesting. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. You'll see another. You'll see another image of him here in just a minute. That's equally interesting. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but, but it's a the the uh, this drain which was draining, keeping the cellar of the house dry. It also had another function. Uh, and the square there is the, the manhole, if you will, that would have been uh, used to clean it out periodically to keep it from getting clogged up. And so almost certainly an enslaved child would have been sent down into that, that hole to clean that out. And I think that's something that we have to recognize is that this is a space, it's not just John Custis's space, but there are numerous enslaved individuals that are running this property. And so we see something like that, we start to you know, remember that they're, you know, they're a part of this landscape as well. And we'll see more of that as we go through more of the archeological evidence. And um, one of the artifacts found in that, in that drain, at least little to the imagination is this which is a chamber pot. So it gives you a sense of what, it, what the drain is being used for. And um, this is a colonoware chamber pot. Colonoware is a low fire, locally made earthenware that is being used, produced and used by both um, Virginia Indians and enslaved individuals and, and most likely free blacks too. Uh, and then being sold around town and everyone is using them. Okay, I've got, here's the, here's the real deal. We might as well show it off, we got it behind me here. So this was found in that, in that vaulted cellar, uh, vaulted tunnel, which is pretty cool. But the real start of the show, actually your, your eyes are probably drawn to the building in the background. That's one of the buildings from Eastern State Hospital. It's called the Thompson Building. It's a, uh, it was a ward for female patients and it's just on the edge of the Custis Square property. Uh, but the real stars of the show were two wells, actually in particular one well, a, 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 uh, a brick-lined well, which we see in this image. And I also want to point out that the two individuals excavating here are uh, Thomas Banks and Daniel Loudon, uh, two African-American men that were employed uh, as archaeological excavators. And oftentimes when we talk about the archaeologists in the past, we, we talk about Ivernal Hume and, uh, and James Knight. And we neglect the fact that almost all of the excavation was being done by incredibly skilled individuals like these men here. And so I wanna point them out and make sure that they get, get their just uh, credit for the work that they did. So Thomas Banks and Daniel Loudon. Uh, Daniel Loudon there has a very distinctive pork pie hat. So we always know him in, in the, all, all the images that we see of him. But the well, the well was just an absolute, um, I, I hate to use the word treasure, but it was a treasure trove of, of materials uh, when excavated. And we see Ivernal Hume, director of archaeology, uh, pretending to be lowered down into the well in this image. He actually wasn't, wasn't lowered down in there. He, uh, uh, this was just a photo opportunity. But anyhow, the well produced an amazing amount of artifacts, including dozens and dozens of wine bottles at the bottom of the well that had been dumped down in there, all of them with John Custis's seal on them. And um, including 
uh, along with these wine bottles, a silver shoe buckle completely intact and whole and still usable. Uh, why are these things being thrown down into the well? Uh, the date of these all fits in the 1750s and pretty sure that what happened is after Martha and George auctioned off uh, everything they could out of the house, what they couldn't sell off, they just dumped down into the well, just gathered everything up and dumped it down into the well. And if anyone's ever dealt with a loved one's estate, you know that you eventually get to the point where you're just done and you, you have to move on. Uh, and I think that's I think that's what George and Martha were doing and dumping this stuff down the well. And just really quickly, my favorite artifact that came out of the well is this. It's a, a fife or a flute. Um, it's made out of iron, and, but it didn't begin its life as a fife or a flute. It is actually the barrel of a pistol. Uh, which somebody had taken apart is probably no no longer usable, and they turned it into a to a flute. So this, those objects that give us those kind of glimpses into uh, into daily life, into people. I mean, we can all kind of I think uh, um, you know relate to perhaps boredom, <laughs> looking for something to do. Uh, that might be the, the case here. So that's a neat neat object. And we had here we go. We had uh, George and Martha drop by the site recently, and they. Uh, they let us know that they threw all that stuff away for a reason. So they couldn't understand why we were trying to find it. Again. <laughs> but actually, these are two of our interpreters that do portray Martha and George, and they're uh, they're pretty amazing uh, actors and scholars in their own right. Uh, another object, even though they were not looking for, for the gardens at the time in those early excavations, there was some pretty cool information that was discovered about the gardens through some of the artifacts. This is a a uh, uh, excuse me a, a terracotta flower pot. And the bottom of it has been covered in pitch. So that black that you see there is pitch. And what appears to have happened is someone is waterproofing this pot to keep water in it. Normally you want water to drain out of a water, uh, out of a flower pot. But in this case, I think what we might be seeing is uh, the attempt to create the environment that Custis was seeing in swamps and actually be able to propagate some of those, those swamp species in a wetland environment in a flower pot. And then another one that I'll point out here that was found at those excavations is the base of a flower urn, possibly even an urn that would have been used in the fireplaces of the house. And you'll note is just this bright, vibrant red. And um, we've got technologies at our disposal now that allow us to, to learn much more about these things. So we did paint analysis on, um, on the paint of this, this flower urn to see what is this vibrant red. And what we discovered is that there's two layers of paint, a lower paint of kind of a, a bluish gray that was then covered over by the bright red paint. And looking at the pigmentation of the two paints, the one on the bottom was uh, pigmented with carbon black and white uh, lead. And garden treatises of, actually paint treatises of the time uh, refer to using that, that pigment combination to mimic stone or lead. And uh, the upper red was pigmented with vermilion, a very expensive pigment, and red lead, which gives you that vibrant red. So what I think is going on here is that originally the, uh, the urn was painted uh, to mimic a you know, more expensive uh, material like stone or lead. And then later they, someone changed their mind and they painted it in this bright, vibrant vermilion which is an imitation of cinnabar, which is the, uh, uh, the basis for cinnabar lacquered um, boxes and artwork in Chinese art. And at the early 18th century, oriental art was all the rage. And so I th think we see someone's changing uh, sense of fashion here with this, uh, with this little urn. So it's neat how you can get this, this information out of sometimes simple objects. Okay, let's dive now into, um, I don't wanna keep us all night here, but let's dive, dive now into uh, what we're starting to learn with the current excavations. And we started the, the, the current work by doing ground penetrating radar. And that's what you see, the, the whole four acre lot uh, was scanned with ground penetrating radar. And if you look on the left-hand side of your screen there, you see that bright red, uh, it says, highlighted as foundation and iron pipe. It kind of looks like a lobster. That is the foundation of the Thompson building, that building from Eastern State Hospital that we saw on the edge of that picture. So it showed up just bright as day. Uh, <clears throat> on the left-hand side of the image uh, where it says shaft type feature and foundation, all that red kind of um, speckling on the side there, that's all the midden, the kitchen midden. That's all the stuff that is just piled and dumped out of the kitchen on that side of the property. So we've not excavated that yet, but we now know, you know, we'll, we know where to go. Um, and we targeted it in the very beginning. Uh, it's a shaft type feature there. We thought, oh, could this be another well? Um, 
is it Bacchus in the ground? Is, is that where he is? And so we, we went right there, first excavation units to see what that was. And, um, and Victoria's face there says it all. It actually turned out to be um, sheet iron roofing tiles and window screen from when the public hospital was demolished, actually when it burned in the 1800s. So it was not Bacchus, unfortunately, but you know, still interesting, I suppose. Okay, but what we have started to find and are starting to get really good resolution on is the garden and the shape of the garden and, and where a central portion of the garden is located. So I'm showing here uh, a blue rectangle, which is the house. So that was what was found in, uh, in 1964. What we have started to discover, and I've outlined it with the black lines here, uh, is the outline of a central portion of the garden that was connected to the house. You say, okay, well, how do you know that, that it's there? It's from finding, like clockwork, post holes, and, and, and they may be a little hard to see. So the red arrows are, are pointing at the filled in holes for very large wooden posts. Every eight feet, uh, we're finding them. And as we start to excavate more and more and more, they keep going and going, creating this outline that we're starting to see. And amazingly, when we start to excavate into these, these holes, the wooden post is still there. After almost 300 years in the ground, the wood is still intact in these posts uh, and they're Eastern red cedar. And so we see one there and they are sunk three feet into the ground. These are massive posts. And you're asking, well, what do they make? They make a massive fence is what this is. It is the fence that surrounds the garden. And we'll see another outline of that here in a minute. And here's, uh, here's just one of the posts as it came out of the ground. We were able to get a big chunk of it intact and preserve it. And these, are, these posts were originally almost one foot in diameter. So again, let's think about this landscape in terms of the labor needed to create this vision of John Custis's. You know, digging a three foot hole and putting a one foot diameter uh, post in it is fine once when you have to do it over and over and over and over again. I mean, it really drives home the amount of effort and labor uh, that enslaved individuals were, were uh, made to do to create this landscape. And, and here's the, we're looking at now kind of backed up and looking into this, this garden space that I've got outlined in the black there. And it jogs, uh, you see the well on the left-hand side there. So it jogs around the well and goes down. And this space measures 160 feet wide by 200 feet long. And we believe this is the core garden. This is probably the primarily ornamental section of garden um, attached directly to the house. And we discovered, I say we, we discovered it, many people know about this image, but we did not until we did this project. Uh, this is a plan uh, from 1758 of Bartram's garden in Philadelphia. Remember, Custis and Bartram were friends and they were swapping plants and they were, they were uh, you know, swapping letters back and forth. And look at the layout of, that, of this garden and this fence that is connected to Bartram's uh, uh, house. And Bartram visited Custis Square uh, in the 1730s. So I'm not saying that he got his idea from John Custis, but, but I think this is something that these guys are doing, these big fenced enclosed spaces. And it's really neat to see, kinda, it kind of has a jog too, just like uh, we see in, in the Custis fence line. And then another one, it, it, really, there are many examples of these big fenced in gardens. Um, uh, here's, here's Cardis Grove uh, from when it was restored, uh, looking from the house out to uh, the river there. And then one that has just been recently that is starting to be restored is up at Gunston Hall. And uh, similar thing, big fenced enclosure attached directly to the house. And we see that here. They, they have just started this restoration. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really in its infancy. All right, I mean, that, that's a big fence that is going around this thing, 160 feet wide, 200 feet long. That is a lot of wood. You know, it almost certainly is paled in, so posts right next to each other. And so, I mean, this is, this is amazing. We, we discovered right inside a portion of this enclosure, I've got it circled here, and I'm gonna expand on it here in, in a second. A, a pit feature, and we didn't know what it was at first until we started to expand it. And on the left-hand side is the full pit. We, we dug half of it 
but you can see the full outline of it. And then for scale, Adam, one of our field te technicians is down inside of the excavation there. This is a saw pit, almost certainly. We, we talked with our own carpenters here and they said, oh, a fence of that size, you would have to have a dedicated saw pit just to create all the lumber for that thing. And I think that's exactly what this is, is the saw pit needed to create this massive fence. So again, just a reminder of the amount of labor uh, that went into creating this garden. I, I mean, there's more wood in that fence. There would have been more wood in that fence than the average house uh, in, in America at that time. Okay, let's get into plants just a little bit here before I, before I wrap things up and get to some questions. Uh, what we started to find, we're looking back at those, uh, the area of the fence posts, but running, and there they are, unexcavated. Uh, because once you find one of them and you know what it is, you don't need to excavate every single one of them. So we've left many of them filled in. But right next to them, along the western edge, are little planting holes that run right next to them. So they would be right next to the wall of the garden. And inside the fill of several of these planting holes, so the soil that, that filled them in, that the, the plants may have been growing in, or they might have pulled the plant out and the soil went back in, in several of them were these little things. These are tenter hooks. These are the things from the phrase on tenter hooks. They are little iron spikes that are used to stretch, normally stretch fabric or leather. Now, in this case, we're finding them near plants, along a fence, what else could they be used for? And I think it's entirely possible that they are being used to string up lines that then these little plants that we see in the holes, they are espalier fruit trees that are growing along the fence, inside fence of the garden. Turn back to um, uh, English uh, gardens. We're looking at rest house again. We saw the big vista uh, earlier on in the presentation. And th those are all espalier plants along that fence there. And so I think that's what we're seeing is actually espalier fruit trees on the inside of this garden wall, which is really cool to get that resolution. Now we've replanted espalier trees all over Colonial Williamsburg, but that was always on just on precedent and thinking, well, I'm sure they probably had them. But in this case, we know exactly where they are. Um, and then inside, Okay, so another, uh, another set of, um, of, of posts and square or posts and planting holes here. Uh, but these posts are much shallower than the big ones. And, uh, in and there's planting holes in between the posts as, between, as opposed to next to the posts. And I think what we're seeing here is a row of uh, probably maybe uh, vining plants that are along a low fence or possibly even hollarded trees like we see here at Mount Vernon. So creating these alleys of trees, uh, you know, in this very artistic way going down the side of the garden. So again, this is just resolution that, um, that we don't always get in a garden. And the goal is to be able to put this back exactly as it was to restore this garden back to its original appearance. Again, most of the gardens in Colonial Williamsburg have been done on precedent and in the Colonial Revival um, uh, time period. So uh, we've got an opportunity to start at the very beginning and get these plants back exactly where they were. So let me end on this. Let me end on a cliffhanger here before opening it up to questions. Um, a couple of these features, these planting holes and fence posts that are along the side where these espalier trees are growing, we found the one on the left. The only thing in it was a fully articulated foot of a cow. And then in another one, it was an entire skeleton of a chicken put in the hole. And what the purpose is, I don't know yet. Um, we, you know, the first thing we think is, oh, could it be fertilizer? No, you don't use entire animals for, for fertilizer. Um, and so, Again, we start to remind ourselves that this garden has more influences than just the European influences of John Custis. And could we be seeing influences of, uh, of others in this garden, particularly enslaved individuals who may be bringing their own practices into this garden? Um, this is an a, a avenue of research that we will have to flesh out in more detail. Uh, making those types of interpretations requires a lot of data along with it. But it is sure is intriguing to see these just individual, well, whole animal or element 
buried in their own little hole with these plants. So uh, it's a curious thing. Uh, I'm fascinated by it, and I look forward to digging more into this part of the uh, of the project. So with that, I have taken more than probably my allotted time, but uh, I, uh, I appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to ask, or not ask, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Okay, those those two little mysteries at the end definitely piqued my interest, so we'll have to have a I, conversation. I put those in for you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I have, I, I really, I miss digging and I, I was watching your slides and all the stuff coming up. It, it got me all nostalgic. So we do have a question to start off the conversation. Richard Jones asks, who did Custis buy the land from? Should be a fairly straightforward question. Who did Custis buy the land from? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so Williamsburg was laid out, um, it was established as a city and lots were laid out at the very beginning in 1699 and then you bought them from uh you bought them from the city and I, there was a mechanism for buying them and a board of people that you would you would buy them from um but there, nobody owned them prior to him uh well no i take that back somebody would have owned them prior to them but that, essentially their property got taken when when they developed the city of, of williamsburg and so what he did is he bought uh every lot was supposed to be a half acre but because he was John Custis, he bought he bought eight half acre lots and he combined them into one four acre lot. And he, so he essentially bought them from the city. Okay, I have a question for you um, for myself and for on behalf of Stratford. So I'm curious about tulips. Whoops, there you go. I'm curious about tulips. How common were they? I know that he was you know obsessed with them. Was that something that you would have found at some of the more elite you know sort of homes in the colony? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, people. People were obsessed with tulips. I mean, there's there's tulip what they call tulipomania in in the Netherlands, um, and I think that was I think it was in the 17th century, where people were speculating on tulips. I mean, they were they were investing in tulips, and and literally people went bankrupt buying and investing in tulips. Uh, That's wild. Yeah, it's a it's it's it is really pretty wild. Um, but even uh, in the 18th century, tulips were still very popular. Uh, all sorts of different varieties and people would would go after you know they, they would collect them kind of like people collect well, whatever people collect uh, you know and and so they'd have exotic names to them and be named after kings and princes and all this sort of stuff um so the, yeah it was very popular so good to know uh somebody asks if there has been bioarchaeology done i'm assuming there's some sort of you know soil samples that you're taking and getting that sort of yeah. Level of data. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've been doing, um, uh, we've got the samples out right now looking at pollen and phytolis. So two types of plant remains that can give us some sense of what types of plants are growing in the garden. Um, we don't have the data yet. It, it just went out uh, about two months ago. So we're waiting on that data to come back, but that could give us some resolution on, particularly on those planting holes of what's, what's growing in them. I think based on them being most likely espalier, they're going to be fruit trees of some sort, but we may be able to get even more resolution than that to know that, oh, it's it's a pear or it's a or it's an apple. Yeah, that's so fantastic. The work that you did too at Poplar Forest, not to pivot towards the other site, but when you were trying to recreate the Jefferson landscape, that was really wonderful what you did there with the, you know, all the work yeah, that you were doing, with the trees and all that. Yeah, thanks. That, that, and that's really kind of the next step. <laughs> One of the big next steps in this project is to get, excuse me, to get into that data, to start looking at the pollen and and, and really get down to the, the details. Yeah, no, definitely. So Douglas um, and Debbie from Ohio ask, with all the gardens, did they grow any vegetables and fruit or family for, or for family use? Yes. Oh, abso absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and a lot of these big ornamental gardens, uh, they would actually incorporate the kitchen garden into them. And, and so the idea was that you would, you would have both um, use and ornament, as they would, they would say, in, in your garden. So yeah, it was really common to have your kitchen garden and your vegetables that you'd be eating growing in, along with your ornamental garden um, uh, plants. 
What I love about Colonial Williamsburg, and I've done several fellowships, the Rockefeller Library, and I get to stay in Colonial Williamsburg, and there's all these gardens everywhere, and you don't realize until you really spend time sort of walking around in the mornings, when you see these gardens, half the stuff, you can literally just go pick and eat. I mean, I wasn't doing that, but a lot of the ornamental gardens were flowers and edibles, too, which is like a really beautiful way of presenting the natural world in those spaces. Uh, yeah, Kathleen, it's accurate, it's accurate yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Kathleen says, fascinating presentation. Thanks so much and looks forward to updates as the work progresses on the site. Any other questions as we are wrapping up this evening's presentation? It was really fantastic. And I, I love, um, you know, I love the ways in which you present, you know, the archaeological data, but also the social history, the material culture, and sort of all of the fabric threads, you know, of the 18th century. It's, it makes it really interesting to learn about anything, I think, the well, ways in which you did that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Rebecca has a question here. I can ask this later if it's too specific, but it's okay. Um, but what is the source that suggested that Brimo uh, recess was modeled off of both the Custis House and Bacon's Castle. Ooh, that's a yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, oh gosh, I'd, I'd have to look it up myself. Yeah, um, I, I believe it's a, I believe it's a letter. I, I'd have to look that one up myself. Yeah, yeah, Rebecca, just go ahead and email me. I can put you in touch with Jack, and we'll we'll get to the bottom of that. And thank you for zooming in, Rebecca. And yeah, so and somebody asked as well if there's any way to see the program. I recorded it. So we have all of our, our programs recorded on our YouTube channel. So just go ahead and look that up, uh, stratfordhall.org on YouTube, and you'll find all of our programs. Anything else from the, the wonderful audience here? Anything at all? We can go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you, Jack. It is always a pleasure hearing you speak. I love the work that you're doing now. I will be coming down to bug Good. you at the Custis Garden and uh, maybe hop the fence if there is a fence. And if you let me go poke around in the dirt, I'd be delighted. And, you know, it's your talk also really has me thinking about, you know, what's at Stratford Hall. So one of the reasons I wanted you to come talk tonight was not only that you're doing this amazing work at Colonial Williamsburg and you're a colleague and a friend of mine, but you know, there's just so many similarities between the Lees and the Custises and all oh, these yeah. elite families in Virginia. It's really nice to have that kind of, you know, sort of a cultural comparison with other elite families in the area. Yeah, ab absolutely. As, as we look, and you know, you think, oh, what, what more can we learn about Virginia gardens? We've been studying Virginia gardens for a long time now, but but the archaeology is giving us resolution on these things that we didn't have before. And so, I I think it is worthwhile to revisit all of these big gardens and, and with new eyes, with new techniques, and start to. We know they're all connected. Now let's see what those connections are, and and can it help us with the interpretation of them, a more accurate interpretation of some of these spaces? So I would love. To the, the Stratford Hall. I can't, I can't wait to be up there again. Oh yeah. You're welcome anytime. Well, thank you so much, Jack. Thank you all for zooming in. Have a wonderful evening and come visit us soon at Stratford. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks. Jack. Really appreciate it. I'll talk to you later. Yep. Bye. Bye.